Okie doke. Hello, everybody. This is the CircuitPython Weekly Meeting for Monday, December 6th, 2021. This is the time of the week when we get together to talk about all things CircuitPython. I'm Dan. I'm sponsored by Adafruit to work on CircuitPython. Um, CircuitPython is a version of Python designed to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. CircuitPython development is primarily sponsored by Adafruit, so if you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython, consider purchasing hardware from Adafruit.com. This meeting is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server. You can join anytime by going to adafru.it slash discord. We hold the meeting in the CircuitPython dev text channel and the CircuitPython voice channel. We usually hold this meeting on Mondays at 2 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time, 11 a.m. U.S. Pacific Time, except when it overlaps with the U.S. holiday, then we usually move it to the next day. If the meeting time is changed, we'll notify you via Discord. Uh, you can look at the pinned uh, messages at the top to see what's going on with respect to the next meeting. And there's also a notes document there for adding your notes to the next meeting. We record the meeting both in audio and video form and then put it up on YouTube and some other places. If you don't want to record your voice, you're still welcome to participate via the text chat or just by putting your notes in the notes document. The video of the meeting, as I mentioned, will be posted to YouTube. The audio is released as a podcast. Um, there's a notes document to accompany the meeting. You can find the notes document, or I can post the notes document, actually. Here we go. Oops. Here's a link to the notes document uh, if you want to add your notes. Um, the meeting tends to run about an hour or less. Uh, and notes document has timestamps so you can move around easily in the recorded um, sessions to find out what you're looking for. So uh, the meeting is held in five parts. News, state of circuit Python, hug reports, stat and status updates, and then in the weeds at the end. So we'll get started with community news. I'll start with a timestamp. Let me bring up here. Okay. Oops, I'm adding my timestamp to the wrong document. Okay. All right, we'll start with community news. Um, these are items from the CircuitPython or the Python for Microcontrollers newsletter, which comes out on Tuesdays. So these are the upcoming headlines in the newsletter that's not yet published yet. So first thing to know is that CircuitPython 7.1.0 Beta 1 is available. Beta 0 was shipped relatively recently, and Beta 1 has a few fixes. But there are plenty of more things to fix. Uh, you can look on um, our uh, CircuitPython um, repo in GitHub and see the list of issues to be solved for 7.x.x. And that's the, we're trying to address most of those for 7.1.0. Um, next headline is that we hit um, we hit 30,000 um, 30, uh, 32,000 users on the Adafruit Discord community. It keeps gradually increasing. We hit 32,000, I think, on late on Friday sometime. So you'll see more publicity about that. It's great to continue to see the community grow. Um, and then the last headline I have from the newsletter for this week is that uh, there'll be a RISC-V summit this week. Um, the event is in person and also virtual. You can see some links here that have been posted. Thank you, whoever is posting the links. Uh, Foamy guy, thank you very much. And um, we, you know, we have a few chips that we support. I think one actually right now that's Risk Five, but there'll be more in the future. So keep an eye on this new emerging open source technology. Uh, as I mentioned, the CircuitPython Weekly Newsletter comes out on Tuesdays. There are ar archives at adafruitdaily.com. You can s contribute news to the newsletter by uh, setting a pull, sending a pull request to the draft, which is uh, 
there's an URL mentioned in the notes. And you can also uh, tag us on Twitter with pound circuit python or hash circuit python, or you can mail cpnews at adafruit.com. Any of those are fine ways to get us news items for the weekly newsletter. Thanks very much. Okay, so now we'll move on to the state of circuit python. I'll take another timestamp and spell it correctly. Uh, in this section, we talk about how things are going in CircuitPython, its libraries, and the Blinka library, especially, uh, as a separate section. So this is mostly about pull requests and issues and so forth. So I'll do overall, the overall section. Um, overall, we had 38 pull requests merged with 16 authors. Um, I maybe see one person I haven't seen before, Aaron Tusco, maybe Aerialist also, I'm not sure. There were 11 reviewers, 30 closed issues, 30 issues were closed by 17 people, and 22 were opened by 14 people. That's great. We have fewer issues open than last week, which is excellent. Okay. I'll, I'll then do the CircuitPython core. That is the core CircuitPython um, uh, firmware. In there, uh, we had 21 pull requests merged by 10 authors, reviewed by seven people. There are still 15 open pull requests. A lot of those are drafts. They're awaiting various things. Um, so it's not terrible. We try to keep that number down, but it doesn't matter too much. We had 15 issues closed and 15 issues opened. There are 458 open issues. A lot of those issues, over 400, are long-term issues that are discussion issues or long-term features or low priority bugs. Under the 7XX category, there are 23 open issues. Um, we hope to fix those for 710 or the majority of them. Uh, so take a look at any of those issues if you want to work on something or if you have something to contribute or even if you just want to test. Uh, some of those issues are old, and maybe they've been fixed in 7.1.0, and you don't, we don't really know that in the beta versions. So now, um, Katni, if you're available, uh, could go ahead and talk to us about the libraries. I am available. All right, so this section applies to all of the Adafruit CircuitPython libraries, which is everything that starts with Adafruit underscore CircuitPython underscore, as well as a couple of extras. So across all of those repos, we had 16 pull requests merged by seven different authors and 10 different reviewers, leaving us with 67 open pull requests. Uh, the oldest one that was closed was 144 days old, or merged rather. Um, so it's really good to see that we're still picking up older PRs. Um, we had 15 closed issues by 13 people and seven open by seven people, leaving us with 642 open issues. 258 of those are labeled good first issue. If you're interested in contributing to CircuitPython on the Python side of things, check out circuitpython.org slash contributing. You'll find all of this information and more. And uh, if you are interested in helping out by reviewing, uh, you can take a look at all the open pull requests, see if any of them um, are something you have hardware for and you can test, or take a look at the code and let us know whether you think it looks good. Uh, any kind of thing like that is helpful. Leave a comment and let us know that you took a look. And once you're more comfortable with that, we can talk about leveling you up to joining the actual review team. If you're interested in contributing code, you can take a look at the open issues. If you're new to everything, Good First Issue is a great place to start. If you are um, looking for something more complicated, bug or enhancement may be a place to go. Um, comment on the issue, let us know that you're working on it. And that way nobody else uh, tries to work on it at the same time. Um, and if you need help with getting started, we are always available to help. There is a guide on contributing to CircuitPython with Git and GitHub, and we are also available in Discord all week long. Uh, in terms of library updates in the last seven days, there were no new libraries and four updated libraries, uh, which are available in the notes. And that's what I've got. Okay, thank you, Caddy. Okay, Melissa, could you do the Blinka section? Sure. Uh, Blinka is our MicroPython and uh, CircuitPython, er, I'm sorry, let me start over. Uh, Blinka is our CircuitPython compatibility layer for MicroPython and 
uh, Raspberry Pi and other single board computers such as that. And this week we had one pull request merged by one author and one reviewer. We have six open pull requests. I think it's actually a few less because I got a few in uh, merged in this morning. Uh, there are currently zero closed issues by zero people and zero open by zero. And that leaves 65 open issues. There were 15,299 Pi Wheels downloads in the last month. And we are currently supporting 77 boards. I think actually we have a few more to add that got added in this morning as well. So hopefully that number will be larger next week. And that's it. Okay, thank you, Melissa. Okay, now we'll move on to Hug Reports. Uh, Hug Reports is where we uh, get a chance to thank people who've been working uh, in the Circuit Python community for various purposes. Um, it's sort of the opposite of Bug Reports. Uh, we held the section, all the section as a round robin. Uh, I'll start and then we'll go alphabetically after that. I'll start basically to give an example of what a Hug Report is, and then we'll just go down the alphabet. Uh, we used to wrap around, but it made things more complicated. So this is an easier way to do it. Um, so I'll start, I'll take its timestamp. Um, I'd like to thank Jeff and Jerry, who are, who've been trying to work out a difficult issue where there's some kind of interaction between using SD cards and airlift boards, the ESP32 ESP SPI boards. And some people, for some people, they have a lot of trouble with this, and other people can't duplicate this problem at all, and we can't really figure it out. So if you have a problem with this, uh, find the issue in Adafruit Circuit Python issues and see maybe if you can try it yourself also, and maybe you can figure out what is the difference between the things that it's working on and the things that it's not. It might just be the SD cards, but we've tried a lot of different SD cards, and. Uh, for some people, any SD card works, and for some people, any SD card doesn't work. So we haven't figured that out yet. Okay, I'll go on to um, C. Grover, who's text only, so, so I'll read their contribution. Uh, thanking Foamy Guy and Sedacious for helpful coding examples that were essential in moving the scale and retro widget projects toward the next coding plateau. The air is slightly thinner up here. Uh, now we'll do David Gloud. I'll also read his notes. Um, thanks to Anecdata for a lot of networking things I discovered recently, and thanks to Tanu for the inclusion of the Raspberry Pi in CircuitPython.org and soon the Learn system. Okay, phone me guy, go ahead. All right, thanks, Dan. Uh, this week, Hug reports for uh, GitHub user Aaron Tusco who uh, found an issue in the AVR prog library, and they submitted their first ever contribution on GitHub. Uh, first time they ever um, pushed anything to a repo and made a PR out of it, so that was really cool to see. Um, uh, thank you to Katni, uh, who had a nice chat with me last week that I definitely appreciate. Thank you to Scott, who helped diagnose some logs that I got out of GDB and pointed me in the right direction on fixing an issue with RP2040 uh, NVM storage. Um, Dexter Starbird, uh, who created some really cool display I.O. examples and shared those on the Discord this week. Um, thank you to Lady Ada and PT for all of uh, all the work they do and uh, the opportunities that they have given to me. And then a uh, group hug to everybody else. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Foamy Guy. Uh, go ahead, Jeff. All right. Uh, I want to start off with a group hug and then a second smaller group hug to the uh, Adafruit Discord moderators. They've had some um, items that are a little more complicated than a simple ban and forget to deal with in the past few days, and for the most part that's been going good, so thanks to them for keeping on top of the community. Uh, more technically, I wanted to thank Anecdata for keeping an eye on some stuff about USB PIDs uh, that we're going to talk to, or talk about, I guess, uh, over in the related issue. And to Foamy Guy for agreeing to take on a little uh, question mark Display I.O. project. Uh, I'm sure we'll hear about that when it is time. That's what I got. Okay, thanks, Jeff. Okay, Jerry, you can go. To... That's that's the mute button, not the button. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, um, so thanks to, to Scott for uh, helping me get started with trying to look at the Broadcom ports. And uh, Katni for uh, and the whole moderation team for for setting and maintaining a really high standard for the moderation on this Discord server. 
and uh, a group hug to the team. Okay, thanks, Jerry. Okay, Katni, go ahead. All right. <clears throat> so my first hug report is to Andy Tuno on GitHub for reporting a discrepancy in the pinouts uh, information on the Itsy Bitsy RP2040 guide. The pretty pins diagram was accurate and the pinouts details were not. So that was good to get that fixed up and uh, thanks to them for reporting it. To Carter for always helping me figure out uh, pin decisions for guides, specifically this time, whether or not to include specific pins as touch pins for both the Feather ESP32 S2 and the KB2040. To Foamy Guy for a lovely chat and taking a very important step forward. And a group hug to all the folks on Discord who put a lot of energy and effort into helping other folks. I'm incredibly proud of this community and its members. And that's what I've got. Okay, thank you, Katni. Okay, I'll read uh, Keith Bee's uh, contribution. Um, they send a group hug to the community for being awesome. And now, uh, Melissa, if you're ready. Yeah. I wanted to give a hug to Jerry for uh, testing out Pi Camera on the latest Raspberry Pi OS release. A hug report to Katni for adding some helpful info and in reproducing the, a web serial ESP tool error and a group hug to everyone else. That's it. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'll read uh, Mark Gambler's uh, contribution. Take his timestamp. Uh, he has a group hug and then next is Scott also known as Tanute. Um, he's not here today. Uh, uh, Scott would like to thank Jerry for testing the Raspberry Pi port. Thank T. Ikigami for pointing out the cool struct feature of U the UC types uh, uh, native module in MicroPython. And to Foamy Guy for fixing the RP2040 NVM issue. OK, that's it. For hug reports, we move on to status updates, where we uh, is our chance to sync up on what we're doing. It has the same format as the previous section. Uh, you're welcome to talk about what you've been working on. Um, it doesn't have to be um, a. Uh, it could be something that you're doing that's not Circuit Python related. If your other things are going on in your life that you'd like to mention, so no problem. Okay. Um, I'll go first. Uh, I, the first thing that I, I did the, uh, this past week was I did some minor work on async I.O. Uh, mostly there are some problems with bundling that particular library into the bundle because it doesn't, MPY cross is unable to compile it in the 6.x bundle. It works for the 7.x bundle and we don't have any mechanism right now for excluding it from them. The two bundles are the same, except that they're compiled to different versions of MPY cross. So we may have to figure out some way of doing some versioning on that. Right now, I just put in a lot of caveats, various places to tell people to download the library directly. But I've gotten five or six people who said, where's the library? And um, it's a problem. We need to fix it. And then also, I've worked on several bugs that are on the 7xx uh, issue list and knocked off like two and a half of them so far, working on the other half, and we'll keep working on some other ones as well. So that's what I've been up to. I'll move on to C. Grover, who's text only. Um, C. Grover says, conducted a marathon session to wrap up the scale project version 2.0 alpha. Significant progress, improving operational performance and memory usage with a robust UI. You can see that in uh, C. Grover's GitHub uh, repo, Cedar Grove Studios slash scale. Scale of version 2.0 alpha, code size increased 21%, but free memory increased from 22 kilobytes to 68 kilobytes. Woohoo! And there's a complicated and interesting chart here of how the memory allocations changed. Scales, graphics, and touchscreen zones are display size independent. Built-in board size is automatically detected, user specified for other displays. Font sizes are based on display size, but do not scale proportionally. Tear and alarm settings are stored on the SD card and used upon power-up. To facilitate testing, the code will simulate a missing custom load cell Featherwing board, which is important during the ship, 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 
the chip shortage to be able to simulate this because the board may not be available. Revise the scales, custom featherwing PCB design to accommodate a less desirable but available chip package. DIP16 chips are huge. Next, take a break from retro widget development to make a metrics portal snowman decoration with random blizzard and global warming modes. Place that ever-growing Osh Park and Stetzel order. Resume retro widget development once I play in the sandbox enough to understand how extending a superclass works. Okay, we'll move on to David Cloud, who's also text only. Um, Circuit Python things. Tested Wi-Fi monitor mode with Feather S2, added booster progress bar on my copy of the MagTag COVID vaccination percent tracker. See a Twitter post on that. Non-circuit Python things, added booster in my body for better protection, a lot of Tasmoda failure, trying to use an ESP8266 in an IKEA, Vindrick, Vindrick thing air quality sensor, which is, has a PM1006 sensor in it. Let me fix the typo in the previous um, timestamp, and I'll take a timestamp for Foamy Guy. Go ahead, Foamy Guy. All right, thanks, Stan. Uh, last week, I dug out a couple of uh, Arduinos uh, from deep in the deep in the pile of microcontrollers to try to learn enough about those to be able to test the PR on uh, the AVR Prog library. Um, that was definitely an interesting adventure. I have not too much experience with um, with Arduino and building the code for it and programming stuff on it, so I had uh, quite a bit of stuff to catch up on. But it turned out to be a, a fun activity. Um, I uh, worked on a fix for the RP2040 uh, NVM storage. So um, whenever the next releases, if folks grab that, we should be able to write stuff into the NVM storage on those um, devices now. I worked on a PR for PyBadger to add support uh, for the, the LC version of the hardware, which has um, a few of the components that are on the PyBadger are not populated on that one, and the cost is a little bit cheaper. Um, somebody brought that up in the Discord somewhere that they tried using the library and it um, wouldn't import correctly, so I think we got that resolved. Um, I have had a, a list floating around in my mind of core module examples that I wanted to eventually see get created, and I finally got those written out uh, on an issue on the repo in the CircuitPython org, so if folks are interested in uh, helping contribute. That's where you can um, find that list and contribute uh, your own ideas or work on the examples. Um, for this week coming up, a couple of things in mind are working on trying to build the board.py file with all of the available pins in it. That was something we discussed a little bit in the weeds last week. Um, look into the uh, the work that Dan has done recently on uh, cooperative multitasking. I know there's a learn guide out there, so I want to go through that and try it out. And then um, I got a Pimeroni Pico system this week, so I'm planning to start working on porting some of the existing games I have over to that device. Uh, so I think that'll be fun as well. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, Jeff, you can go ahead. All right. Um, so as you were talking about, Dan, I tested but failed to reproduce some reported problems with SD cards and the airlift sharing a spy bus. I did put in some PRs for the ESP32-S3, including support for three boards. And then just this morning, um, I figured out some of the problems that were keeping me from getting the display going on the ESP32-S3 box, um, and there's a pull request in for that as well. This week is a short week for me. Uh, I'm going to re-verify some of the camera functionality and build a small demo for internal use. And uh, I'm going on a little travel again, so I will miss the meeting next Monday. So have a good two weeks, everybody. Okay, thanks, Jeff. Okay, uh, Jerry, you can go ahead. Okay, excuse me if I'm a little, little winded. Just finished my exercise bike. <laughs> um, so I did a bunch of experimenting. I tried with the Broadcom port. And um, just to, okay, I don't know again, who else has been working with this other than Scott. But the, the 2W, 0-2W worked sort of as expected, but I can't get anywhere with the 4B. So um, I'll, I'll bring that up in the weeds um, if there's any desire to talk about it today. But with Scott not here, we can decide if, it's, if there's any reason to continue that. Um, 
But I'm curious, if, particularly if anyone else has been able to use a Pi 4B with the Broadcom port yet. Um, now I submitted some PRs for the RFM 9X and 6.9. A uh, forum user had suggested replacing time.monotonic with supervisor.tixms whenever possible, and uh, that was an easy change to make. So it's it's in it's in review and uh, is working fine on both boards. And then um, yeah, so just uh, for those who have Raspberry Pis and have been struggling with their cameras on Bullseye, um, just in case you're not aware, Raspberry Pi did a le release uh, is now supporting legacy support for the camera on Bullseye, so you can bring back the old camera support, which disables the new camera support, so you can one or the other. But at least I found out that some of my old projects that use the um, uh, camera interface, web cameras, were working now. <laughs> and the BrainCraft hat now will will install normally, but TensorFlow Lite still doesn't quite make it. There's some compatibility issues with one of the, one of the major, with the TensorFlow Lite library, so um, we need to work on that. Um, and then, so I tried to make sense of this, this this SD card issue too that both Jeff and Dan reported, and I had some different experience with it. Um, I could not reproduce at all the original posters problem with the Wi-Fi with the air, air lift and the SD card. Um, so I think there are two different issues going on there. Um, I did run into several problems between SD card I/O not working and SD card working, but. In several go rounds, I just ended up getting more and more confused. And when I updated everything to the latest version of CircuitPython 702 Alpha, uh, 72 Alpha, whatever, everything's working for me now with all the SD cards I have. So I don't know what's going on. <laughs> Wish I could help more, but it's very confusing. Yeah, this is very confusing. Everybody <laughs> seems to have a different set of problems or no problems whatsoever. <laughs> Thank you. All right, thanks, Jerry. Okay, Katni, you can go ahead. Hello. All right. So last week, updated the Adafruit community code of conduct with a couple of new things. Uh, we'll be updating it on Discord, and then we'll make an announcement um, also on Discord with updates uh, so that we so that the details are very clear. There, the details are already clear on GitHub because you can check the most recent pull request. Um, but we just want to make sure everyone's aware of any changes. I published the Feather ESP32 S2 guide, um, did some Arduino ESP32 S2 BSP updates related, learned what BSP stands for. Um, I taught Anne how to use the Adafruit Learn System template. Jerry, you're unmuted. Oops, sorry. <laughs> um, Basically, the I'm the only one who's been using the templates. I, I wrote them and I use them, and now I get to find out whether or not the instructions that I put in them are clear enough for someone else. Um, I published the core of the KB2040 guide. It still needs the CircuitPython Essentials pages, but we wanted to get that out for folks. Wrote the ESP32S2 and a separate RP2040 factory reset templates to put into the ESP32S2 and RP2040 board guides and updated the circuitpythonpins.c for the KB2040, so the silk pins come first where there are multiple names for the same pin. So far today, fixed the ITSY RP2040 pinouts page, one of the pin details was incorrect, merged a couple PRs, and continued on the KB2040 guide. So this week, I'll be finishing the KB2040 guide. I'm gonna be testing uh, Foamy Guy's Pi Badger PR on a Pi Badge LC. Uh, Foamy Guy doesn't have the hardware, and I do, so I'll be testing that before merging it. Update the ESP32 S2 factory reset page to include the Arduino flashing option. It turns out if you flash a basic Arduino sketch onto an ESP32 S2 that doesn't have a bootloader or has a broken bootloader, UF2 bootloader, um, it comes free with the UF2 bootloader. So if you already have Arduino set up, it's sort of a magical way to fix the bootloader without having to use the web serial ESP tool or the command line ESP tool. I'll be starting the Neo slider guide. That's a new product. Uh, you need to update the DHT guide to reflect the fact that not all boards are supported. Um, I need to verify that the Feather ESP32 S2 pretty pins is not correct. It turns out it might be correct, and I made an assumption. Um, but it's on my list to verify that the touch pins in Arduino that are indicated are accurate. Um, I'm going to make a PR to the CircuitPython Adafruit I.O. guide. Um, the 
example that I did for the Feather or that I adapted from Jerry's code for the Feather ESP32 S2 does two things. It checks to see whether or not a feed exists on Adafruit IO. And if it does, it gets it. And if it doesn't, it creates it and then it gets it. And in talking to one of our internal devs to make sure that that was okay to do, um, because the code obviously runs every time because it uses deep sleep. So it does it every time. And I wanted to make sure that was okay and that was fine. Um, in talking to Justin, um, we thought it would be nice if there was a create and get feed function in Adafruit IO so that you don't have to actually put the function in your code. You can just do create and get feed and it will um, do exactly that where it checks to see if the feed exists and if it doesn't, it creates it and then it gets it. So I'm going to be adding that. Um, and then I have a number of existing pretty pins diagrams that have not been put in their applicable homes, not in the PCB repos and not in the guides. So I need to make sure those end up where they're supposed to be. And that's what I've got going on. Okay, thank you, Kadney. Okay, go on to Maker Melissa. Hello, um, <clears throat> let's see. Last week I finished writing the guide for the for a nunchuck blazer cat toy which is currently in moderation. Uh, I added some missing boards to circuitpython.org. I test out the microbit v2 on uh, CircuitPython code editor on several platforms, but I was unable to get working on Windows. Uh, I started looking into an error with the web serial ESP tool and found a reliable way to reproduce the error. And uh, this week I am going to continue working on that web serial ESP tool error. Uh, I'll add a few of the new Blinka boards to circuitpython.org and probably uh, some guide updates after that. That's it. Okay, thank you, Melissa. Okay, I'll read the next two entries for people who aren't here. Or Mark is here, but uh, text only. Uh, Mark says, got an IS31 function based on pixel buff working, similar to NeoPixel. Really dove into the core and native class subclassing. If anyone has any questions, Foamy Guy and I and myself discussed it a bit in a thread on Discord, or feel free to ask me. Need to determine where to place any Python libraries related to IS31. Need to PR the core work, core work I did still. I don't know what IS31 is, but I'll find out. Uh, are we talking about the, IS, the thing that's in uh, the glasses, I guess? That's right. OK. Uh, and then Scott Tanut, uh, who's not here, as I mentioned, uh, I'll read his status. Last week, added pinmux info into Broadcom peripherals. That's for the uh, Raspberry Pi uh, Broadcom port. Added pin and use checking and resetting. Added support for all I2C peripherals. Uh, over the weekend, I figured out my desktop power supply was failing and causing my wake-up issue and maybe other things. That's good to know. This week, I'm finishing the CircuitPython and Raspberry Pi Learn Guide. Started during my stream finishing full UART support, getting a COVID booster shot on Tuesday afternoon, so maybe slow Tuesday after and Wednesday. Last stream of the year on this Friday and back on January 7th tentatively. Okay, put in an approximate timestamp, I'll guess. And finally, uh, we'll go on to the in the weeds section, which are more detailed technical discussions of things that we want to have some back and forth on as opposed to just status. So, um, Jerry, you can go ahead if you'd like. Yeah, so let me, let me just start out uh, with a question. Is, is anyone else who is online using the Broadcom stuff to work on the Raspberry Pi 4B at all? In uh, which case, then that may explain why. <laughs> I, I don't think anybody has gotten it to work. You're not the only one who hasn't gotten it to work. Okay. Uh, have other people tried? That's good to know, too. All right. Uh, uh, I, well, one other person tried, maybe. I, I'm not sure, but I don't remember okay. who that was. The compute module right. works, and it's strange that the. Yeah, the compute module would... seems to work fine, and the, the 2 0 for it works really well. Uh, yeah. Well, it has, has some of its own issues, but it works, comes up in a REPL. Right, right, right. And yet, so, and for anyone who's looking at it, that what I did find is that when I hooked up, OCD, open OCD, and got the everything up. It it just comes up to the starting address of zero x two hundred and sits there. It it doesn't move, <laughs> um, so it doesn't appear to be running at all. Um, so at least as far as I can tell. And then I had some other questions. Again, I don't know if anybody else can address these who's worked with this 
tool set. Um, when I installed the Arch64 tool set chain, it looks like it's the GDB is built with Python 2, not Python 3. That was the one I downloaded from wherever there was a link to. I'm just curious if other people have run into that. And again, has anyone tried or care? <laughs> Um, well, GDB uses an embedded version of Python, so I'm not sure. Yeah, because the, there's a script, and this is my other question, that in the peripherals area, there's some scripts to use with GDB. And I'm a little fuzzy about how you actually go about using those. But when I tried to import one of them, it gave me an error, which is clearly a Python 2 versus Python 3 error. When I took the Python 3-isms out of it, it loaded fine, but then I still don't know what to do with it. But maybe I, we should probably skip all this, and I can bring it up. Probably yeah, you import it in GDB. Right. There's some way to, do, to run the scripts from inside GDB, and then it uses the right interpreter. Right. But it's clear yeah. that the version I have, and I couldn't, I couldn't load, I couldn't run GDB until I installed the Python two dev um, library. So, you know, maybe I need to rebuild the arch, the whole uh, tool chain, which is fine. Um, but I'm just curious if anyone else got one with Python three in it. Because I, I, I would have thought this would come up. So again, maybe uh, again, any, if anyone else is doing this, otherwise, I guess the only one I know of who's using it is Scott, and I'll check with him when, when he's available. Yeah, I am well, back. I know. Oh, hi, Scott. Oh. Uh, are we in the weeds? Yes. Yeah. OK, because I, I didn't want to derail it otherwise. Um, I, I feel like I saw that, too, and I don't remember how I got Python 3 and GDB instead of Python 2. <laughs> Um, I thought I had installed it straight from the ARM source, but I don't remember. Because, and there is no GDB-PY anymore, is that correct? I mean, these not in my distribution, there's not. Right. My understanding is that in the later stuff, they just always have Python okay. in it. Okay. Um, I might have built it myself. Okay. Well, I can exactly, give that a try. For exactly and that reason. Okay, and then so what do you do with those scripts when you so you there's the one called Core A Cortex A is that the one you use? Yeah, so it you don't need it. Um, there's a couple tools in there that can be handy. There's one that will read the um, there's a there's a fault status register that you, that it will read and interpret for you. So it'll tell you like this is a page table fault or an access table fault and, and like try to give you some more information. Um, that's in there. And then there's also a thing that tries to better do, do better backtraces if you're in an exception handler, AKA an interrupt. Okay. Um, because unlike Cortex M, Cortex A doesn't do any uh, stack manipulation when entering in an exception. So the first thing you have to do is do that, which means there's not a standard way of doing it. Um, and so there's a there's a thing in there to like try to unwind the stack correctly across those frames. Okay. So it, when you you, know, you you source that file and then you go into a, a, a Python session to, to use this the, the tools in it or how do you know there's so for the the backtrace thing it'll just automatically pick it up oh, okay. uh, when you do a backtrace and then there's also there's like two commands that it adds. Um, there, there's commands at the GDB prompt then. Correct. So there's oh. like arm arm v eight exception, and then there's another one. Oh, I I added a dump stack thing as well that will read from the stack pointer to the top of the stack and just try to figure out source code lines for it. So basically, like if your stack is broken, trying to give you an idea of what the stack is, even though it's broken, okay. um, sort of thing as well. But it's not required. Like you. Right. Like, okay. Well, it's working fine. You know. Be well, nice to. to you know, I'll just try to rebuild it. Right. I don't know anything better to do. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I, I, I think I, I'll have to look. But like on Arch, we have like package build files that can build them. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe I, I had to bump the version of the one that they. I was built. actually able to get that script to run by just there's just two end equal statements that didn't like. Uh, I took those out and it okay. actually loads fine, so it probably will work. Okay. I thought. Too yeah, anyway. yeah, yeah. It's not doing anything super fancy. And then okay, and then is it is it your sense that the the 4B port is just still broken. So, <laughs> yeah, I was hope I was hoping I'd be able to get to it this week and take a look. Okay, no, I'm, I'm, no pressure for me. I'm just curious. Yeah, I don't want to, you know, go too far. You know, it just 
Like you said, I, I was hoping if somebody else said, oh, it works for them, I was going to just see if I can get a, an executable I mean, in. But, what I would try first is is just try disabling the mass storage and seeing if it works. Uh, the USB mass storage. Okay. Um, so you, you won't get the circuit pie drive, but you'll... You have to do that in the config.txt file? No, I'm talking about in the CircuitPython build. Oh, in the build, oh, we do the build, okay. Yeah, just like the CircuitPy underscore USB underscore MSC, just turn that off. Okay. Um, I would try that. I, I, my guess, it, what the problem is, is that booting off SD card is like putting the SD card peripheral in a, a different state that like I'm not recovering from. Because I think it worked before that when I wasn't doing the mass uh, storage stuff. Okay, thank you. But now that I'm trying to do that, I think that might be the problem. All right, thanks. Um, so I, I'm hoping to get to it this week, but I've got a couple other things to finish first. Okay, no, this is I understand that <laughs> the the pre state states state of this, so there's no yeah, no rush. I mean, one of one of the things I do want to do before I switch off of it is do a better pass at like the whole family. So adding zero support and making sure that the ones that I think work actually work. And oh, the other question I had quickly, and I think I figured this out, but to use the, the 2W works with the Pi 3 config file, which it does work. Right. And, it, and, and the 4 goes with the 4, the 4B four is with the 4 config file, correct? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Along with the CM4. So, okay. So everything, everything, everything non 4 goes with the Pi 3 config. No. Oh, was it like I, don't, I don't know about the 1 or 2 yet. Oh, I okay. I haven't looked at that. Right. But the. The chip on the zero two W is the same chip that's on the it's three. Threes. It's on the threes, yeah. Ah, uh, okay. And so, what really matters is like what CPU is in there. That's the thing that matters the most. So, any anything with a Cortex A fifty three, which is what's in that Pi three chip, should work with that. Okay. Open and just just for your information too, um, the the Open CD is working fine. I did try and get JLink Commander to or JLink EXE to work with it, and it talks to it, but. Mm -hmm doesn't quite work. So okay. Cuz it says it supports the A7 and the Cortex but M7. But right, the the A7 though, not the A72. Oh, it's A72, that's why. Yeah, yeah, so the Pi 4 is an A72. The Pi 2 is an A5 and then the Pi 1 is a ARM 11 something uh, something. Right. Right. Uh, some I'm weird sure. long thing <laughs> before they came up with that branding. All right. Thanks. Yep. Okay, thanks. That was that was interesting. Okay, uh, Mark, do you want to go on voice to discuss the yep. IS three one thing? Okay. So, as a brief summary for anyone, um, what I was trying to do is get the ring lights working on the glasses in addition to the display I/O, and where I ended up was trying to make a subclass of. Uh, Adafruit pixel buff, because then it follows the same standard that NeoPixels do, and we can take advantage of other libraries. In the end, what I did is basically copy what NeoPixels do, and they've got that NeoPixel write core library that actually does the writing. And that's called from a Python, well, from the Python NeoPixel library. So I've basically replicated that for the IS31 driver and it, it works now. Um, so there is a core PR to go with that. That's simple enough to put in. Uh, the question is, is where to put the Python library? I don't want to cause confusion in the current uh, IS31 Python library. So I'm not quite sure where the best spot to place this is. And it's similar, there's the the pixel buff Python class. And then there's also all the mappings that map the LEDs that can be placed there for the common products that are sold. So I would want to see it before for sure saying that this is a good idea. Um, but I think if we name it something very clear, it can be a longer name um, and then document it, that will basically alleviate the confusion and we can just make sure that we document the fact the difference between the current IS31 library and the ones that you are going to contribute um 
So I think I think it's just a matter of naming and, and documentation, to be honest. Like, okay, what I'll I was just gonna say what I can do is get together like a zip file of it and send it to you. That would be for great your, for you to look at. So it's not you don't have it in a repo yet. I don't have it in any repo yet. I literally finished it yesterday morning because I was trying to get it for a project okay. yesterday. Because you can. I mean, that's it. fine. It's. Go ahead. I was gonna yeah. say it's easy. It's easy to rename repos as well. So if we like generate one and then as a group decide it's a bad name, um, we can you know before we put it in the bundle and so on, we can um, make sure that it's you know something that we as a group agree on. Um, but I just I just want to take a look at it and make sure I'm not steering you wrong. Um, so a zip file would be fine. A yeah, zip file, or actually, I could just fork the library and put it in my own repo, I guess. I mean, whatever, whatever works, you know. Yeah. But like I said, we can, um, we can always, we can always update things. Like that's the yeah. great thing about version control. So, um, I would say let's, I let's take a look at it, um, see if that makes sense, and then we'll just get it up in a place where we can discuss it publicly and um make the decision then sounds good i mean you can make your own repo and we can throw it away or transfer the ownership of it too so uh it sounds yeah, to me like it, it might, you might well. just add like underscore pixel buff at the end right now or something like that so yeah i didn't even come up with a good name because uh, you know i was in a hurry to try to yeah finish naming, a product. naming things is hard <laughs> yeah Especially with ISFL three seven four one to start. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. How do you remember that? Yeah. Yeah. You write the Type. guide. That's how you remember <laughs> right, it. Right. Right. Type it in code a thousand times too. Okay. That's it on that then. Thanks. Right. Perfect. Okay. Thanks. Okay. All right, Katney, you want to discuss um, meeting times? Yeah, I just wanted to make sure everyone was aware, um, and Jeff posted it to the text channel earlier on. Um, thank you, because it meant I didn't have to dig it up. But I wanted to point out what the, the, the meetings are going to be for the holidays. Uh, the next meeting is next Monday on the 13th. Um, the following Monday on the 20th, we will be having a meeting. The following Monday on the 27th of December, we will be having a meeting. And then the next meeting after that will be January 3rd, 2022. Um, the holidays all fall on Saturdays this time. Um, normally, we drop one in the middle if it falls in the middle of the week. Um, <clears throat> but we decided that it actually made sense to just have meetings straight through um, because it kind of, it, it's not going to impinge on any um, actual holidays or uh, the holiday observed days on Fridays. Um, so again, we love to have everyone, but please don't feel obligated if you've got family uh, obligations or any other sort of obligations. Um, don't don't feel like you need to attend the meetings. Obviously, you can leave us notes if you want us to read it off. You can absolutely attend if you want to, um, but we will not be offended uh, if you can't make it. So just to make that clear. And unless there's any questions from anybody, that's all I've got. Okay. Anybody have any comments? Okay. Great. Okay. So we'll wrap up the meeting now. Um, You've been listening to the Circuit Python Weekly Meeting for December 6th, 2021, on a Monday. Thank you, everyone who participated. Thank you very much for all your detailed uh, hugs and, and uh, progress reports and all that. If you want to support Adafruit and Circuit Python, and those of, the work, those of us that work on Circuit Python, consider purchasing items from the Adafruit shop at adafruit.com. The video of this meeting will be released on YouTube at youtube.com slash Adafruit, and the podcast will be available on major podcast services. Uh, this meeting will also be featured in the Python for Microcontrollers newsletter. That's coming out tomorrow. Uh, visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe. Uh, the next meeting, as we mentioned, is going to be held uh, next Monday on the 13th of December. Um, the meeting will be on native for Discord, where you found this before, adafru.it slash Discord. If you are a new person and you want to be able to talk during the meeting, we add you to the circuit, at sign circuit Pythonistas role on Discord, and we'd be happy to do that if you want to participate. So thanks very much. Thanks for everybody for being here. We hope to see you all next week, but we understand if this is a busy time of year for everyone. So if you'd like to take a break or you need to take a break, that's great. No problem. Thank you. Okay.
I will stop recording now.